Hello, everyone, and welcome to an all new Deep Cuts Live. I'm your host, Antoine Reed. And today we have a special guest with us. We have Lee Marsh from Stolen Throne Cigars. He's someone that I met for the first time a couple weeks ago when we were all in Vegas for a trade show. And on the spot, uh, I asked him to be a guest and he said yes. And he followed through and I followed through and here he's, he's here with us today. So let me bring on our guest. Lee, how are you? Going good, Antoine. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Like I said, uh, thank you for coming on. Like you were one of those people when I was at the trade show, I was looking for some companies that I haven't interacted with a lot. And I kept hearing all this buzz around the trade show. And this is no lie. Um, you know, and people are like, stolen thrones, stolen thrones. I had him hearing his retailers talk amongst themselves, especially in that little lounge area when they were passing by. And they were like, you know, who, who are you going to see? And they're like, have you seen stolen thrones yet? And I was and they were like, no, and I was like, okay, I need to add this company to my list. So when I was doing my I rounds, it. thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, man. when I was doing my I rounds, I, I saw you all, and then like I said, I made that time to come over and see what you because you had a very interesting setup yeah. with the wagon, and then you all were playing country music, which got you know caught my attention because for those of you who don't know, like PCA, usually in the past when Drew Estate was there, they would play this like hip hop kind of, you know, that kind of rap kind of music and it would be blaring like the whole show and everybody around the booth would complain because they said they couldn't hear and stuff like that. And then you all were bumping like country music and, yeah. um, you know, and, yeah. and I think Brian yeah, we was like, like <laughs> we like rap and hip hop too, but Noel and I are both big fans of country music. So it just felt like it was the, the way to go. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it caught my attention because I was like, "Ooh!" I was like, "They're playing like Luke Bryan," and then there's like some other songs that were that were playing. I just thought it kind of set the mood for like your whole like booth area and uh, the whole. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate your patience too. I know we were slammed when you stopped by, so I appreciate you waiting. Uh, I, no, I thought like, no, I would appreciate you all because like, I know that you all were speaking to um, you're speaking to uh, Smokers Abbey. Who I know the the cup I know Rebecca and um, her husband so I was yeah. like oh, I was like I'm not gonna interrupt that's all what the trade show thing too is like you you're there as media to do coverage and then you know you all are there to, to make money and make connections with the retailers so it's always like you know I have no problem ever like waiting uh, waiting my turn and, and let you all get the business part done because I'm just there to get a video and get some pictures and stuff like that and set up some interviews and for the, like this. So I appreciate yeah, you all. Guys are, you guys are super important. I mean, for us, you know, we don't, you know, we're very much grassroots and kind of just being who we are. So we don't go out of our way to like advertise or put ourselves out there. So you guys are very important to us. And I, you know, I get, I had so much anxiety making sure I talked to everyone I could, you know, at the show, but we be we were super lucky to be small. So, uh, no, I'm happy to be here, man. Thanks so much for inviting yeah. me. You know, before we went live, we were talking a little bit about music and our love of vinyl, which is something completely different, you know, not for me, for with vinyl, especially when they put some thought into the packaging. It's like I'm old enough to know, like I used to buy CDs uh, and what you would love about the CD is like opening up, getting a little booklet out, oh, interact yeah. with the booklet. And you would read all the little notes, the lyrics, you would see the pictures and stuff. And then you know, when, you know, MP3s and stuff came around, it was like, we, we lost that. So, and, you know, and it was just, and we lost the booklets and we lost the interacting and you would just kind of listen to the music and it all kind of morphed and you wouldn't, you could skip, you know, entire songs and like with vinyl, you have to like really, <laughs> you like, you can't, you can skip songs, but it takes a lot of time. You usually just like, let it play. You know, I think that's a good point. I, I think it was kind of a trade-off, right? I, I, I agree with you. Like, I never forget, like, getting All Eyes on Me, the double disc Tupac album, right? And then, like, you know, having the book, like you're saying. But then, you know, with MP3s, you do lose that, but you, you were forced to focus more on the music, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and then vinyl, it's the experience, right? And there's some people that, like, for me, there's artists that I only want to hear them on vinyl. And just because 
captures writer intent, captures everything. There's just something about it. Like maybe it's the nostalgia or whatever, but there's just some, I don't know. It's like an ambiance that it provides it. It's just totally different that you can't get. Like HD is great. Like, you know, being able to pull up Spotify and pull up everything from Waylon Jennings, Elvis, Madonna on my phone. Like that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like you were saying, sitting and having to listen from track one through on a vinyl is completely different. Yeah. And I think sometimes like the, the, you know, the art or the whole lifestyle around collecting vinyl kind of relates to cigars in a way, because there's so many people who look for kind of rare cigars. Like we were, we were talking about looking for rare albums and it didn't really matter the price point. Sometimes we spend a lot more on it than people, than we probably should, or people would think we would. And uh, I think that happens too with, you know, cigars. Like you might come across a cigar that you just really want to try or something that's kind of uh, not readily available and a retailer will find a box of, you know, these rare these cigars that are rare now. And they're like, oh, you know, and they don't think anything of it. And all of a sudden, like, you're ready to sit there and buy that. And you want to buy a couple. You want one that you can kind of save as a collector's item, even though they don't really increase in value. But then you want one that you can kind of smoke. And so I think there's like a lot of correlation between, you know, vinyl. I've done, I've, done I've done that. Um, but I smoke them, right? Like they're meant to be smoked, you know, but exactly. you, know, you do kind of like ration them out. Um, but yeah, I've done that. And I think sometimes the hunt, you know, we see it now with, you know, bourbon or music or cigars, like sometimes the hunt to some folks is more important than the actual getting of that item. But for me, it's like, it's kind of stepping back in time. Mm hmm you know, and I think like what you were saying with like playing the vinyl from start to finish, you know, it kind of forces you just to relax and kind of in this world where we're so, we need to be gratified immediately. We have all the stimulus and those moments where you're just putting a, a vinyl down, you're in for the long haul. It's going to take what it's going to take to get to your song and you just kind of play it out, you know, and, and some people, like I was telling you, we were talking about Jamie Johnson's guitar song. You know, the way that he wrote that album, he wrote it to be on vinyl because one song actually rides right into the next. Like the end of the song will be the intro to the next song. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's all about the experience in those in those situations. And I think that relates, like I said, again, to the whole cigar world. You know, the thought, I'm sure you as a brand owner have a completely different experience than maybe somebody who's listening to this who just, a consumer, but the thought that you put into the whole process of making a, a cigar is kind of like how that how artists I think used to th see music maybe like they used to put so much thought into like the whole album like this is like from start to finish like you know we got to put it in the right sequence because if this song you know comes in the wrong place it'll completely disrupt the mood I want somebody to have like this this experience I'm pretty sure that and maybe I'm wrong but maybe that you kind of approach cigar making and cigar blending and even putting together your whole portfolio of products kind of in a similar you're way. You're hundred percent right. And that's so funny that you said that, like you might be the first person that's kind of made that kind <laughs> of connection. Like I've talked to consumers a lot, like everyone knows how big I am into songwriters and country music and, you know, those old, like really brilliant lyricists and stuff and both, you know, hip hop and country. But the, the thing is, is like, I don't have that talent. So with blending cigars, at least you're right. I do think about it that way. You know, how do you want it to start? How do you want it to finish? How do you want it to get from third to third? Um, and you are telling a story, you know, in, in the only way. And like you were saying, like consumers might not get it. I, I think they do. I think the creative process, while it's different for every person, it's still the creative process. And I think, you know, um, you're hundred percent right. You know, as a songwriter might tell a story, we're trying to tell an experience with the cigars, you know, even our brand as whole, like we talked previously before going on air, like, you know, this is our journey through tobacco, right? You know, we started as consumers, as those nerds that were at every event, every year, smoking, whatever we could, finding the rare stuff, finding something new. And now we're on the other side of it. So now we're, you know, consumers are walking through our, our journey with us as we, you know, advance the portfolio and, and put out different projects for sure. Yeah. And, for you as a cigar maker, cigar blender, um, how important is that story to like the blend? 
because I asked that because a lot of times on deep cuts, when I have people on, I'm always interested in the story because I feel like the industry right now is you get a lot of press releases and a press release is like wrapper binder filler. This is the price point. You know, it's going to come out on this day, buy it. And it, yeah. sometimes you're missing out on the story um, of like, why did you create this in the first place? And I know, I know some companies probably, you know, like, maybe, you know, depending on your size, like maybe you don't need a story. Maybe it's just, you know, it's just like, you know, like a commodity, like a Coca-Cola product, you know, you right. know Coca-Cola, what their, what their story is. It's just like part of like the street, you know, that's this, the business, like we're going to put out a new product to stimulate sales, to get you excited. Here it is. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you're right. the story is super important. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, for us anyway. I mean, especially, and you can look at it at a grander scale of like the business aspect of product differentiation and elastic market, right? But I, I think the story is is super important to who we are. I mean, we're we're brutally transparent and honest about what we're doing, and I I think you know I'm smoking the crook right now, which is our very first cigar, and for that it was just this pressure to make something that you could share with someone else that they actually enjoyed. But realistically, it had to be self-serving because I always joke, like if we couldn't sell them, we were going to smoke 10,000 of them. So then it, and then, so you have that, you have that abundance of success with the first cigar. And then it's just like you were saying with the next album, what do you do next? Because no matter what you do, it's going to be compared to the first one. Mm -hmm. So doing something completely different every single time we, we out a product is always the mindset because I never want to be predictable, but it still has to fall in line of what we're trying to achieve and the story we're trying to tell. And so you're always at like this different point of the same journey of trying to be successful. And like, you know, when people always ask me, well, what, what's it feel like? When did you know that you're successful? I said, well, I don't know that yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we, you know, so I think to your point, like the story for us, and I'm sure there's other brands out there. I know there are other brands out there that the story is just important to them. I mean, for us, it's all about authenticity, though. I'm not going to make up a story just to give you one. It's just right. going to be a part of the journey as a whole, as as you would say, writing the album. So, uh, but it's very important, you know, as a blender. You know, I always say, like, I have no idea how you know, the great songwriters write their songs or their creative process. But for us, it's it's never about picking what we're going to do before we get there. You know, we let the tobacco kind of guide where we're at. I never say, I'm going to blend a Habano, I'm going to blend a Sumatra or Maduro. Like, it's just what, what the process dictates at the time that we're actually making the cigar. And even then, I mean, you know, we sit on a cigar for so long, we might get down the road and be like, nah, I don't think it's, the, it's not ready. It's not the time for this. And so it is constant, that creative process and constantly just trusting that to be, to provide the fruits of the labor, you know, and you never really know one way or the other until it's ready. I always say that the cigars tell us when we're ready. We don't tell the cigars, you know. I think that's a good point to, or good, you know, jump off point to get into what your story is. So, um, you know, I know most people, I watched a couple of your interviews with other people just to kind of get an idea. Uh, I always like to, to figure out what, <laughs> I always like to figure out what questions like you're asked like ad nauseum because I know that yeah. I know that there's a question that somebody already asked, you know, the question that we'll get to about, you know, where did the name come from? I think that's like the month, probably your number one question, it seems like it's is. like where did the name come from. But uh, I want to start at a different point and kind of work our way there. Um so knowing that you you call yourself a cigar nerd so obviously you have a long history with cigars so what can you remember what that first your first cigar experience was like and like did you like yeah. it was it something that you kind of like were all for were you res resistant towards it like what was that like well i mean i think the first experience like when you just said that i just contemplated that i've been smoking for almost 20 years uh I'm only 34 <laughs> and the fact that I can say 20 years is alarming. Um, no, I mean, I'll be honest, like that first experience was kind of mindless, right? You're more in the moment, right? You, you're sharing it with a, a cherished family member or a cherished friend and you're so in that moment, you know, we, 
just like a bourbon or a wine or a cigar is the same, but your environment kind of dictates what you feel. Like, even if you like that cigar, that cigar is so much greater in an environment where you're with good friends, having laughs, talking, like just spending time together. And so having my first cigar with my uncle, like it was just in the moment. I wasn't really thinking about the cigar as I was just being there present in the moment. And that's kind of what it always is, even now, even with how hectic, you know, our day to day is with the business. It's like when you have that cigar in your hand and I have one in my hand from about 430 in the morning to about uh, midnight, you know, so um, it's about being in the moment and sharing those things. And, you know, it wasn't something that I really gave much thought to. And then over time, it just kind of rapidly increased, you know, more of those situations because I started like everyone else, like, you know, casual, like with my friends, with my family, you'd have a cigar. You don't know anything about the cigar. You don't know. This is well before I understood blend configuration and all that kind of stuff, right? Nice. And so, and then it grows, and then it grows, and it kind of goes dormant for a while, and it grows again, and then it's, and then really, just became a passion, right? And I can tell you, like the first time that I stepped in a field and I saw the green leaf growing, saw them going to the drying barns, and like where that that process, like I just fell in love with it. And then taking a natural product and being so creative and like we talked about, like basically telling the story with a blend creation is where like it really just took off. Right. But, you know, for the very early years, probably the first five to seven years of smoking cigars, it was just about a social setting, being with whoever I was with at the time and enjoying that moment, you know, and a cigar just happened to be the, you know, the catalyst for that. Or the ad, or the you know the mechanism, if you will. Um, so then it's funny how you know it just snowballs as you ch- start to realize that this is something that you care deeply about, and how could you turn that into something more, right? Like I, I if you told me twenty years ago that I'd run a cigar company, I'd, I'd probably laugh at you, like that's insane, you know. But that's kind of life, right? You just end up where you end up. There were a series of events. Do you remember if that first cigar you had was like a premium cigar or was it kind of machine made? Because I know that a lot of people in the industry maybe it started off with, you know, something that was kind of machine made that they got at a convenience store. Or did you kind of start <laughs> off right at the, the, the premium mark? Well, I started off with a hand roll, so it would have been a premium cigar. Um, and it was a gift for my uncle. Like he was in the military, traveled a lot, and brought him back with him. Um, but that's how I started with the hand roll. It wasn't even a brand. It was someone where he was stationed that rolled cigars, and he brought them back with him. You know, and then you, you kind of transcend from there, right? So mm-hmm. then you stay there, you find your first cigar shop, and all those things. So, so for you, in you're talking about how, you know that cigar started off as something like almost like a way for you to bond with family and friends and stuff like that. And then it turned into a passion. So at what point in the process or how many years did it take for you to kind of think, you know, what would my own cigar brand look like or be like? Probably, you know, it probably took a good 10 years. You know, I mean, I was in my late, I was in my mid twenties when I started thinking and, you know, JR and I started my business partner and I started talking about like, what will we do different? Mm -hmm. You know, how we do this. Like we started to notice some things that we didn't really like, like, you know, you, you pay so much money for a cigar. Like imagine if you paid $300 for a piece of vinyl that you couldn't play right away. Like, why would you do that? You wouldn't do that. You know, and then those kind of things, like what we, and it's just started being like nitpicky of what we would do differently and how we would operate and what, you know, and it, it becomes like that, almost like that folklore, like we'll get to it, you know, you keep kicking it down the road, like, oh, like, I'm sure you've done it with your friends, like, oh, we'll buy that bar one day, you know, that bar's mm-hmm. for sale, one day we'll buy it. Um, and then really there becomes this catalyst of like, well, you have to, either do it or don't do it, you know? And JR is much older than me. And he basically one day just said like, hey, I'm getting older. I understand you're young. So we're either doing this or we're not. And it was in that moment. 
like we had just gotten back from a trip. We were in the Dominican and we've been through a factory. We've been on the fields and like we were both super invigorated, super excited about it. Like we talked about it nonstop for about probably about a month or two after coming home. And he finally was like, okay, like it's, it's go time or we're, we're not doing this. And so from that point on, it just became, you know, a horse with a carrot, right? Like you just chased it and it never stopped. I think, you know, we started making calls and started, you know, kind of developing relationships. We'd already kind of built a network from traveling for work. And, um, and then it became super serious. And I want to say within the next 10 days after that, we were in Nicaragua. So, I mean, we, we went full in. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, those moments, like you look back now, it's kind of surreal where you're like, man, this all started from just a vacation. And then, you know, just snowballed. So here we are now. Um, have you heard of the term blue ocean strategy? I have. I have. So, you know, for those of people who, who haven't heard of that term, this is one that I stumbled on this past year. But the whole blue ocean strategy or mentality in business is that, you know, basically, if you don't do anything, you try to do everything like everybody else does. You're kind of playing in a red ocean, which is like busy, competitive. Yep. And your and what your goal is in business is to create a blue ocean, which is like you don't have as much competition and the whole theory. And I'm just starting to read this book because I've heard the term class around so many times. I was like, I got to read the book now. But the whole idea is that you have to basically you have to create something on the basis of uh, it being different, like innovative or whatever. Um, not so much, you know, something like you can't say I'm going to make a cigar and I, I want it to be just like. XYZ cigar over here and we're going to have success because that usually doesn't lead to success. It leads to like stagnant Correct. sales, stuff like that. So for you, Correct. like, are you, are you, uh, are you in business school? No, I, no, I just like read books. Like <laughs> I just like read books like this. Cause like business is always like a, an interesting kind of area that for me, like I can easily read a, a, pick up a business book and like read stuff. And I'm always listening to Gary Vaynerchuk and, yeah, some other sure, high. because that's one of the first things that, like, and I, I have, I got my MBA, and, like, that's the first thing, and it's really based off of basic product differentiation. The mindset mm -hmm. is that if you pick something that you're passionate about, it'll be easy to get through the low points and grind through because you believe in what you're doing. Not because it's like anything else, but because it's what you care about and what you vision and finding your niche in the market. Um and I think that's really, really important. The blue ocean theory is super important when it comes to cigars because it's an elastic market. It's an elastic product. Like if this stolen throne disappeared tomorrow, there'd be some sad faces, but overall, like they'd find something else to smoke, right? And it's about how you sell yourself as being different. And then once you, uh, you know, acquire that consumer, how do they experience you differently than everyone else? Um, so that's very, very much a big, proponent of what we do and how we operate and i just remember like 2017 when you know i started this latest chapter of my career um the whole the key word at the time was innovation like you could not get around the cigar industry without hearing this word and you know everybody now the press releases and the, you know video interviews they would do they would all say this is an innovative, you know, we're an innovative company making innovative product. And you would say, what does that mean? And nobody yeah, can answer. In a century old business, what does that mean? Right, exactly. It's like, and especially like in cigar, in the cigar world, it's like, what does that, what does that mean? Like, how are you making this innovative? Because this is a traditional product made, you know, in a certain way as it has always been made. So to, in, in your view, like, does innovation really exist in the cigar industry? And if so, like how, like how can it exist? Like in what forms? I, I wouldn't use the term innovative as I would creative, right? Because mm -hmm. I think innovation, like you said, especially now where we are now leads to the, the notion that you're somehow improving upon and using technology to get there. And realistically, we're not, right? Mm -hmm. 
we're, we're making more accessible a centuries old tradition in terms of craftsmanship. And so I think creatively is a better term because there are between packaging, between marketing, between branding. Like I think you could be creative without being innovative, but I think innovative doesn't really make sense. Like it sounds like counterintuitive actually in terms of the whole notion, right? Like how uh, cigars have been around for ages and you're innovating how you're still hand making cigars, right? So um, I, I would, I, I mean, I guess you could say innovative in terms of tobacco production because things they're doing now with, you know, soil analysis and, and, and soil saturation, it's way different and it is innovative. But from an actual manufacturing standpoint, I think it's more about creative. I think it's more about the story you're telling, the transparency, the authenticity. I think that leads more to being creative and innovative, if that makes sense. Yeah. And when you and JR were making this transition from just being consumers of cigars to like business owners, what was that transition like? Was it an easy one to make? Was it kind of overwhelming? And what part, if it was overwhelming, what part of it was like the most kind of kept you up at night or kept you like heart palpitations? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's like you're always at like this different stage of how your, your ship is going to sink, right? Like, at first is like, are people gonna get what we're trying to achieve? And then we had this rapid success and it's like, okay, well, how do we meet the man? So it's like, just learning, like it was super overwhelming and still to this day, like even though, you know, we're three years into it, we've grown vastly, infrastructure's changed and all those things. It's still like very much like the name of the game is being flexible because you're just riding the waves. Like things are always going wrong. Like. We're the quintessential duck, right? On top of the water, we look, seem really calm. We're just doing our thing. But under the water, like our feet are moving a mile a minute. Like that's my brain, like just constantly because things do go wrong. And there's, you know, I think when you when you come from a traditional business background, right? And JR and I were both very lucky to be successful in other things before we started this venture uh, and, and chase this passion. When you're dealing with something as fragile as it, handmade product in another country there's so many things that are out of your control we do our best to kind of traditionalize in terms of american business how we operate vertically integrated supply chain management consumer management all those things but there's so many wild cards i mean i don't control shipping i don't control covid i don't control logistics i don't control customs like the, those things it's like you know so it's you're always waiting for the next thing to come up, but at the same time, maintaining a level, you know, mindset, right? So it's never ending. Like it's all overwhelming, <laughs> but you know, it's, you really just have to be in the moment. Like, but the thing that we learned very early, you know, any MBA will tell you like the, the what they always traditionally tell you is that the worst thing that can happen to you is a stock out. So we sold out in three weeks for launch. No. Right. So you're super happy, but then you're panicking, like, oh my God, I just ruined this. Right. And then you're like, okay, well, we have to get better and we have to get better fast, like changing our burn rates and all those things. Like, um, so yeah, it was, it's, it's a constant exercise and flexibility. That's what I'll tell you. Well, like, I can't imagine kind of being in that kind of position where you're constantly worrying, like, for me, like during my nine to five is dealing with, with the magazines. So I just have to worry about paper costs, which I know that they, I saw in another interview, you were talking about the paper shortages at some point that were causing you to have a delay in getting your labels and stuff like that. that people oh, yeah. probably ever think about, but it's, it's, you know, it's just like you said, it's keeping, it's like, there's always going to be something to worry about, I guess. So you can either sit there or you can it's, it's, going. You, you have to, even though you know at this point we're we're buttingly worldwide like we're still managed like a small business everything down to our shipping supply costs you know paper costs box costs tobacco costs like all these things like you're such in a constant state of flux all the time and you know we love what we do and that really like the blue ocean thing is what gets us through because 
there are days even now with our success where you're like, why did I do this? <laughs> like, why am I doing this? Um, but that's natural, right? Like everything mm-hmm. can't go right all the time. That's impossible. So I know you were saying in a different interview that the hardest thing that you kind of faced when building your, your brand and your business was this coming up with the name. So how was that process? Like how, how many different iterations did you kind of come through? Like how close was this um, to becoming named something completely different than stolen throne? And then like, how do you finally settle on this particular name? Uh, Very close. I mean, that was the hardest part. And realistically, you know, like we talked about earlier, like, it was about authenticity. You know, I didn't want to have to sell something that I didn't believe in, right? Like that wasn't what we were trying to achieve here, you know, at all. I didn't want any of our staff to feel like they had to put on a facade in order to talk about our brand or what we're trying to achieve or like what we believe in, or you know, the, the pillars of who we are. And that's super difficult when you're, when you're, it's one thing to allow creativity to come to you, but when you chase it, it becomes like this black hole. Like you're like, okay. And then no matter what you come up with, you're, you're constantly asking yourself, well, are you settling? Is that really something that means something? You know, what, what is that? You know? And because we didn't, you know, we talk about differentiation to a certain, uh, a pretty heavy point, you know, at this juncture in, in, in the interview, but like, I didn't feel good about just being two gringos that had a Spanish name on our cigar. Like, that's not who we are, right? You know, that's not at anything of what we're trying to achieve. And it became this outlaw brand with Stolen Throne, and it wasn't more than anything else than just out of spite and chasing things that no one else wanted us to have in a crowded market. You know, you, this, this industry is very small. It feels big at certain points because you think about, you know, globally, it's a globally distributed product. But realistically, the industry in itself, uh, you were at the PCA, so you understand, like, the majority of the industry was in one conference, like, one town hall, essentially, one big, you know, open space. So when you think about that, it's like the majority of folks are super welcoming, super nice, super friendly, and then there's others that don't want any competition whatsoever. And, And realistically, Stolen Throne came about with, the latter of those individuals. Like basically, I'm a super spiteful person. Like the the worst thing that you could ever do is tell me I can't do something, right? Like that's mm-hmm. just not how I operate. And it kind of built from that. Someone was basically um, very discouraging about the potential venture and, and us getting involved in the industry and basically alluded to there being no seat at the table. And so, you know, I made the comment that it's okay, well, I'll, I'll steal one. And so weeks later, while we're still in, like, we're getting hounded from everyone. Like, we had already produced the crook. It had no name. With the cigar was ready. It, the, the, our lawyers are about, like, we have to do trademarks before you go to market. Like, we, you have nothing. Like, what are you going to name this company? And, like, and JR was finally like, you know, uh, well, what about that time you told that guy to shove it and we were going to steal one? What about stolen thrown cigars? And then from that point on, it just clicked and that like that became the antithesis. And I'm like, that's perfect. And then everything from that kind of just laid itself out. So like it's like that roadblock. And then once you pass that roadblock, it's just highway all the way. You know? Yeah. And I, like I said, I think, you know, if you look around on the Internet and you go on Instagram and stuff like that, you have so many people talking about Stolen Throne. And I think the name just resonates and clicks with people because you could easily, I guess, name it after, you know, the last one of your last names or something like that, or, you know, kind of named it after the state or the city that you're in and, you know, done all this other stuff, but Stolen Thrones, it sounds like this really, you know, like you said, this edgy brand and it's, it can stand on its own. And I think that's like, makes it different in the industry because like I said, you walk around the trade show floor, your booth, your attitude, you know, the, the branding on your cigars, like how you package them were all, it could stand on its own. Like you couldn't say this looks just like so-and-so. Cause I heard a lot of that, you know, you hear a lot of that at the trade shows too, when the brand owners get to venture out of there, they go, Oh my gosh, that person's booth over there. Like they have this and it looks just like what I do. And then the vice yeah. versa, they the same thing. Well, and I think 
I think you made a really good point. I think, you know, with that story, everyone can resonate. Like, at all points in life, we've all been somewhere where we were against the odds, right? And just choosing not to quit and choosing to pursue whatever we wanted to do, you know? And I think with being authentic and being transparent and being original, it, it makes it not only easier to kind of stand out like you were saying, but also it makes it harder to be duplicated because when someone does try to copy you, it stands out so grossly in terms of like, well, that's what these guys do. So why are you doing that? You know, and it's happened to us. I mean, they, they say the imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but it's, it kind of sucks when it's in terms of creativity because you work really hard to, to, to kind of bring to fruition something that's yours. And, you know, so it, yeah, you're a hundred percent right. And do you consider yourself to be a boutique brand or just are you just a premium cigar brand? Because I ask that because I think boutique is another one of those terms in the industry where it had bad connotations, you know, 10 years ago because, you know, the bigger brands would say, you know, we're premium and those people over there are just boutique. And then you kind of think of it now and you're like, well, A, almost everybody in, in, to some degree in, in this industry is boutique. Um and B, nobody has a definition of what boutique is. So I started just calling everybody a premium cigar brand because I feel like that's what, unless you're making a machine-made cigar, that's what you're you're making. You're not making a, I don't know if you're making a boutique cigar, but how do you feel about that? I mean, I definitely, I mean, we're all, we are a premium cigar company, but we're definitely boutique. And I, I take that as a badge of honor because for us, you know, we get that question a lot in terms of like defining it. And I, I think it's a mindset. Like, I don't think it's a number because at first it was like, oh, if you make this many cigars, like you're no longer boutique. And I don't believe in that because, you know, if you're successful, of course, your numbers are going to go up. Like that's the nature of business, right? Like you're going to sell more cigars as the portfolio gets bigger. You're going to make more cigars. But I think it's a mindset. And I think for me, and what we do, it's about, we always put the quality and the experience of the consumer first. The quality of the product and the way the consumer feels about that product when they spend their hard-earned money on that product. And the day that we stop doing that is we're no longer boutique. The day we start configuring and worrying about the bottom line only, we're no longer boutique and I'm really no longer interested in the business, to be honest. I mean, because it is a passion project. It still is. It will always be. And then when it's no longer, I won't be here anymore. And so I, you're right. It does get this. It did have this negative connotation to where, you know, retailers didn't really want to deal with boutique cigars. And it wasn't because the product wasn't good. It was because, you know, brand owners didn't know how to operate a business or manage expectations or, or be dependable. You know, we, we heard this a lot when we were first starting out, like people love the product, they love the following we were garnering, but they didn't trust us to be here tomorrow. And so, you know, of course I can tell you we're going to be different, but everyone's going to say we're different. Right. You know, and it's all about, you know, getting that opportunity to show you how we're different. And, and I think that was big with, you know, our partnership with Noel Rojas and like the new factory and the new tobacco company developed that infrastructure. So people understand that. We're here for the long term. We're setting it up. We're showing you how we're different. Um, but we're definitely boutique. And I will always be boutique. Because to me, boutique, it's not an insult. To me, it tells you that I'm worried about my product and the quality of my product and how you feel about my product when you smoke it. Uh, so when that goes, I go, you know. So, like I said, I, I think it's a mindset more than a, a production number. Uh, you mentioned Noel Rojas a few minutes ago or just, just now. Could you just tell us a little bit about him? And I want people to know what kind of role that he plays in Stolen Throne. Yeah, Noel's great. You know, when we were kind of shopping around what we wanted to do and, and get started, you know, there were very few people, because we were adamant that when we started making the cigar, we wanted to be in control. We wanted to blend the cigars. We wanted to choose tobacco we want to do all those things because at the end of the day we didn't want anyone to blame but ourselves for our failures right if we didn't make it that we wanted it to be because we just weren't cut out for the business and that's something i could live with like you know just not good enough that's life um but you know there's a lot of folks that don't want you to do that you know and noel was the first one we talked to that he was like cool no problem and 
he's been instrumental in my development in terms of tobacco and learning and understanding as well as like understanding composition and blending itself. I mean, he, I consider him to be my mentor, you know, and, you know, we, we've always partnered with him since the beginning. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we will always be partnered with him. Um, he oversees all of our production in Nicaragua at the Rojas Cigar Factory. Um, he's a very integral part of what we've achieved. And without him, we never really would have gotten that opportunity to kind of express ourselves through our cigars and portfolio. So the crook was your first blend that you created. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So what was that process like of creating your first blend? Because I can, I can imagine it was both probably exciting and then probably stressful <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, it's all of your emotions at once, right? Like you, cause you get there and you're just sampling through hundreds of different tobaccos and you're like, like get in the candy store, like this, 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 this. Um, and then you, you put something together and then you kind of have this time where you're sitting and like, is this good enough? Like, is this going to be like, I knew this was the blend we wanted and I, we knew it immediately. Uh, but then you, you start like the self doubt, the anxiety comes in. You're like, okay, well now it's getting real. Like, is this going to be something that people enjoy? And how do we deliver it? Because no matter what you do or no matter what anyone tells you in this industry, the number one obstacle is always going to be getting your product into the consumer's hands, no matter what. It's an elastic product, right? Like that is the definition of an elastic product. So, yeah, I mean, I went through an emotional roller coaster. Like I was super happy, super excited. Then I'm like, oh, shit, now we have to sell all these cigars. <laughs> what do we do, you know? Um, but the way that the crook has taken off and become like a thing of its own is like, it's truly like, it's surreal. Like I very rarely do I have the time, unfortunately, to kind of sit back and process it all now, which is a good thing. It beats the alternative of having too much free time. Um, but it, I mean, I don't think I could have wrote a better story for, you know, how things went from the inaugural release. And I think that was really important because we had to be different. Like you speak about how we stand out and all those kind of things, but hindsight's 2020, but we knew because we knew we only had one chance to enter the market. You get mm -hmm. one shot to make an impression, mm -hmm. right? And that's a lot of pressure. And I think we were so aggressive and heads down on the grind that we didn't even comprehend the magnitude of that situation. And so now looking back of where we've come in such a short period of time, you're kind of like, holy shit. You know, like, it's like one of those things, like it's the same thing. Like when I was young, I was living in another country at a very young age by myself. And like, you're, you're at that point of age where you're almost, you're too ignorant and naive to understand the fact that if something goes wrong, I'm on my own. Right. Right. So it's kind of the same situation here where, we were so busy pushing forward that we didn't even realize what we were doing. Um, tell us about Three Kingdoms and Phantom Queen. So the Three Kingdoms, uh, that has been like the bane of my existence, right? So like, <laughs> the cigar that I love the cigar. The cigar has been super popular. It's been super well received, which I'm thankful for. But I worked on that cigar for almost three and a half years. Almost the entire time that we've been in existence, I've been working on the Havana cigar. Um, so that came out in November of 2021. I don't even know what year this is. What year is this, 22? Right? 22. So it, came out, it came out in November um, and it, it's it been great. You know, we've been really lucky with the support that we've received. Everyone has always supported us. You know, we have great retailers and the consumers that constantly champion our brand and push us forward. So we're really lucky and they thankfully they've enjoyed everything we've had to bring to the table. The Phantom Queen is a little bit different. So we've had the Phantom Queen ready for about two years, um, but COVID hit, you know, and we just couldn't justify slowing down regular production to push out a limited. So this year has really been about getting back on track with getting some of the projects off our table that we're on, you know, the back burner. So, the Phantom Queen is a full-bodied Connecticut limited edition offering that we're going to do 
it'll be our first 10 count box um, that'll ship sometime in September um, and really kind of getting back in the groove of what we've been doing in terms of production while maintaining our production demand um, and fulfilling that demand. So the, the Phantom Queen will come and then early next year, I suspect our, our next limited, which will be the throne room reserve, which will be a vertical product, meaning that every year that cigars will be older until they're, they're gone. Um, so it's kind of been like this year has kind of been catch up. Like we're finally back to quote unquote normal, whatever that looks like now. Uh, the new factory, so our capacity is greater and all those things. So it's kind of, recreating what we were doing before COVID and we had to kind of put band-aids over bullet holes, you know, right. uh, to get through. So in terms, I know you're a business guy. So, you know, when, when, you, when you look up Stolen Thrones, you don't stumble upon our website. You, you stumble upon like the Instagram, yeah. like I said, Facebook and like the other interviews you've done. So it made me wonder for you, what's been your experience marketing your product or building like that following for it because you think of websites and I was having this discussion with somebody a couple of weeks ago it's like I was talking to another person who was kind of just launched a cigar brand and they were like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about the website later because people don't even go to websites anymore and then I was like and maybe pause and kind of think and I was like you know what people really don't go to websites anymore like you know you kind of with how the news and the internet is kind of set up. It's like the news comes to you and then you kind of go read that article. It's like, you don't, it's not like the olden days where it's like you had your favorite. I mean, I still have a favorite website or two that I go to all the time, yeah. like TV line or, you know, but even like the vinyl news, I don't get news about vinyl from a website and, you know, maybe. Oh, social media. Right. So yeah. Cool. You know, like there's an Instagram account set up and it just tells you all the new releases and you're just like, I'm like, wow. And that's what I look for every morning. And, you know, I go on Twitter, I found out about people dying, <laughs> you know, celebrities dying <laughs> like Twitter wow. and Facebook. So, like, how have you approach the whole marketing and, and branding and building, like, your brand and promoting it in today's age and times? Well, it, it's all about consumer interaction for us, right? Like, we, we make ourselves available. We, we interact with everyone. We're still in Facebook groups. We're still, you know, interacting and doing those things. And to be honest with you, like we've talked about pretty much this whole interview is like, I hate doing what other people do. So like I wore not having a website as like a badge of honor. Like, don't worry, <laughs> my entire staff hates that we don't have a website. But, you know, and I did lament we are going to have one, unfortunately. So my crap <laughs> burned. But, you know, a lot of it is more because you kind of have to gauge that difference between being different and being practical. And it's really just unfair to my staff at this point. They work so hard. And, like, when we have swag that everyone loves so much, like, they need a place to go where they can do that. So the guys aren't tracking down messages on Instagram or this, that, and the other thing. So I finally had to lament, and we are doing a website. I don't really want to, but we are. But also, it gives us a chance to highlight, you know, our retail partners that have been so supportive. It's more about giving back than anything about the brand because for us, the brand has always been about the consumer, right? You know, there's an old, uh, there was an old management style that Nike started and they, they said it and it's true. I don't own the brand. I own the company. The consumer owns the brand. They dictate the value. They dictate the quality. They dictate, you know, the demand for the product, right? So it was very important for us to be exactly what we were just as the manufacturers now. So, and what were we? We were cigar geeks. We were cigar enthusiasts. We, you know, we were supporters and fans, right? And so that's what we try to garner towards. Because to me, while it may be slower, I mean, maybe not in our case because we got lucky, but it's more sustainable. You know, most of our growth still to this day comes from consumers hounding their retailers. Like, hey, why aren't you carrying this stuff? Like, I want to buy this stuff from you. Bring it in. I will buy it. And to me, that was like super meaningful and that to, that's who we wanted to be. I didn't want to be some cookie cutter where you go to every cigar company's website and they all look like they were done by the same person. Like, I hate that. Like that, would, I would lose so much sleep overnight about just cookie cuttering something. 
but you know, you grow and things change, right? And like I said, you know, I want to be able to highlight our retailers because they deserve it. They supported us. They they deserve to benefit from having their names on a map to show where they can get our product, where our limited stuff goes to. Um, then you know, you you have the swag that everyone loves that I can't stand. I hate swag. <laughs> But, you know, those are the things and, and they make it easier on my staff. Our staff works so hard and like the the least I could do is give up on this notion of never having a website. So uh, we are going to do it, you know, but it's been super cool to say we don't have one. You know, yeah. go to Facebook I mean, and Instagram. That's... At the same time, it's like you haven't had one, but I would think that sales have been just as, as good, you know, without you having one. So it kind of proves both points that yeah maybe do you need to you know, like send people somewhere when they have a question about your your cigars and your different cigar lines but at the same time like you were able to to punch in this long without one and you know if this were 10 years ago maybe you would have needed one a lot sooner but maybe we're yeah you know, i mean it's kind of adapted to what you know what the consumer dictated you know it was always mm -hmm. about that i mean and it wasn't some great master plan. It just happened to be that way. And it, it just took off. And I'm like, why would we worry about this? Like, you know, we're so busy. We're not a robust company in terms of manpower. So it's like, why would I worry about something else? Right. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, things change. Now I have to have a website. So where did you? No, it'll be a good thing. You know, it'll be centralized for swag and it'll help us. You know, when we do limited edition drops of, you know, people love our lighters and our hats and all that stuff, and we do it batch style. So when those come out, it's super easy. Everyone gets a fair shake and, you know. Exactly. Where do you see writers working? Where do you see Phil and Throne going, you know, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Like, what's your, your growth plan for your, for your brand and your company? Not to die. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you, know, hopefully, yeah. I, you know, I, I think for us, it's when, when you do something that you're so passionate about and it's so natural for who you are, there really isn't like this mega, oh, I got to get here. I got to get here. I got to get here. It's just maintaining what we're doing. I mm -hmm. hope to still be doing exactly what we're doing now in, you know, one year, five year, 10 years, you know, providing quality product at a fair price point and, you know, basically just hanging out with you and other consumers and media. Like that's, that's the true benefit. Like getting to talk to you, going to events, we love doing it. Yeah. There's a sacrifice and an opportunity cost time away from my family and all these things. But, you know, I always say this and it's, it's very true. And if you ask anyone who knows me closely, they, they'll tell you the truth. I take it very, very personally when you choose to buy our product instead of something else. I understand that cigars are not inexpensive, you know, so when you choose our stuff over the copious amounts of other things you could buy and smoke, I take that personally. And so that's the goal is just to keep doing what we're doing, you know, uh, always getting better where we can. I'm a big process guy. So every constantly improving on things we can improve upon, but overall just just to keep pushing forward and, and operating the way we are. Um, at this point of the show, I usually ask two or three questions of all the guests to kind of, uh, it's like an advice column type thing. I'm sure you, if you've watched it, you've kind of seen the questions, so you kind of have an idea of what's, what's coming. Um, but the first of those questions is, what is your why or what is your motivation to do what you do? It's passion. You know, I always say that like the hardest thing about starting this company was taking the risk because we had no real reason to, we were successful. We were stable. We were comfortable. Like there was no real reason to sink a shit ton of time, money and effort into something that was an unknown, but the passion, the interaction, you know, when it, it really invigorates me when you hear someone that smokes our stuff and says, man, I had a really shit day, but I came home and I smoked a crook and it was awesome. Like, you know, that's the human experience, right? Like that's, that's part of everything. And it's the passion that keeps us going because there are lows, right? Like it's not all great when you're working this hard, you're on the road a lot, you're away from your family. I, I have young children. I miss so many things, 
building a better life for them and, and, and pushing forward, it's the passion that keeps you going. Um, the second question is someone comes to you and they say that they have an idea for a business or a product. It might not necessarily be a cigar product, but you know, they have an idea or that they kind of think might have some success in the marketplace. What advice do you give that person to get started in their kind of entrepreneurial journey? Educate yourself. Like, you know, a lot of times, you know, the passion is the easy part, but setting yourself up for success is the difficult part because everyone wants to cut the line. Like it takes a lot of work. And what I've always said is like, people always see like the quote unquote overnight success of selling burn cigars, but realistically, there were years of development that went before we even sold our first cigar. You know, like Warren Buffett says, like, you know, if you read an hour a day on one topic, you'll be an expert, right? Educate yourself, put yourself in the room with people that have been there, have done things, even if it's not in your necessarily, you know, your segment, still be there, understand where it went wrong and listen, like a lot of people, they want to talk, they want to hear, be heard, but they don't want to listen. You'll get a lot of information by just sitting in a room with smart folks and just letting them tell you what their mistakes were. And that's what we did. I mean, there were plenty of people who were willing to tell us like where they went wrong. And so you just be smart enough to learn from other people's mistakes, but chase it. Man. The worst thing you can do is be on your deathbed and worry about what is, what a, I could have done something differently. Because, you know, it may not work out, but you don't know until you go full force because realistically, and that's the thing, it can't just be a caveat. It has to be 100% of your attention, right? Like, you know, the old adage, like there's no such thing as halfway pregnant. Right. <laughs> but you, you have to, you're either in or you're out. And that was true for me too. I mean, for the first couple of years of Soul on Throne, I had a full-time job and I was doing this full-time. And at some point you have to make the conscious effort and dedication to say, I'm gonna do this full-time no matter what happens, I'm committed. So it, it's all about learning and applying yourself. If that's something you're truly passionate about, put your money where your mouth is, educate yourself to the best of your ability and go for it. Um, early on in the show, you were talking about success. And I think everybody has their own definition of success and criteria for determining whether or not they are successful or not. So how would you define success and how long did it take you you know, with Stolen Thrones to feel like, you know, you were successful. I still don't know that I am. I don't know. I mean, it does. It's a, it is a moving bar. And I, I think in this company, I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm the very, I'm very critical of what we're doing and how we do it. Um, I don't know what that looks like. You know, we try to win every day, right? And so if you can do that, then eventually you'll get to where you want to be. But realistically, I don't have a really set definition of success. And I don't know that Stolen Throne is successful. I mean, it's good, we're selling cigars, people like it, but really is that success? So I don't really know what that looks like. It's always a moving bar. And as soon as you feel like you figure it out, the bar moves again, right? So it's for us, it's more, for me anyway, it's more specific to the moment, winning every day when you can. And then, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's more of success is kind of a hindsight thing for me at this point. Like, but, you know, I, I heard a Michelin star chef, like the youngest Michelin star chef, three stars in the world. Like he's had this restaurant not slow for like three years. And he said the same thing. Like, I don't know that we're successful. Like the accolades, is that really what we want to put it on? Okay, that's fine. But what does that really mean in terms of what we're achieving? You know, so I think that's a good mentality to have just because I know a long time ago I was at some meeting and, you know, this company was going through changes and stuff like that. And they were talking about, you know, like we need to do all these changes. We need to, to implement, you know, this and we need to try this. And and then they turned around and said, you know, but, but this will be successful because our customers love us. And it was like, well, if they love you, then why do they need, you know, why do you need to implement all these changes? Like you should be, right. trajectory should be upward. So like you said, maybe it's a good thing that you should not, you know, get to that point where you feel successful because maybe that's where the complacency and all the problems kind of kick in. Yeah, complacency is a kiss of death, right? And I think realistically, you know, I think the best and motivator we have now is being elastic, you know, 
the consumer is so much more engaged and so much more intelligent on everything not just cigars but in any any real market and buying like the you know the consumer is getting smarter because information is so rapidly available content is everywhere and that's a good thing it pushes you to be better and for us that's the barometer of you know i know if i start cutting corners and things start dropping off the consumer is going to be the first one to tell us and they should be that's their right when they spend their money on your product they can tell you what they feel about it good bad or indifferent whether i like it or not that's just the way it is and so complacency is the worst possible thing when you're trying to be quote unquote successful whatever that is you know at this point of the show um i like to give you a chance to tell people how they can keep in touch with you. I know, like I said, you don't have a website and there's been a banner up on the screen uh, all show, but there are going to be some people who are just listening to this so they haven't seen the banner. So can you just tell people, you know, the Facebook, the Instagram and whatever else that they need to kind of follow to keep in touch with you and to keep up with what uh, all the latest news from Stolen Throne? Absolutely. Facebook at Stolen Throne Cigars and at Stolen Throne Cigars on Instagram. I mean, that's we, we share everything. We're super responsive. Reach out to us. We love talking to you. We love engaging with you. If you're having trouble finding a retailer, we'll happily do that work for you. Unfortunately, we will have a website eventually this year, you know, but um, in the meantime, you can catch up with us. And even if we have a website, I'm going to tell you the best way still is going to be uh, at Stolen Throne Cigars on Facebook and at Stolen Throne Cigars on Instagram. Well, I want to thank you for coming on today. Like I said, it's fun to to get to know you and be able to have like a one-on-one conversation for an hour. I know the trade show, like I said, there's so many things going on that it's kind of hard to, to uh, have conversations of any sort. And uh, so I'm glad you came on and we'll have to have you on again to uh, talk about business and stuff. I think that was for me like the funnest thing is I've never been able to talk to anyone about the blue ocean strategy or have them actually know what that is. So uh my um, pleasure. My pleasure. I can talk <laughs> definitely to have you back on uh, in the future. Um, and maybe we can get, maybe you can commit JR to be one of these and uh, we could talk about be the. for what you wish for now. <laughs> be what you wish for. <laughs> that seems, well, like I said, it's an open invitation. Um, I'm always a, a glutton for punishment. So uh, I would love to have both of you on at some point uh, just to kind of, like I said, change it up a little bit and talk about the industry and your experiences with Stolen Throne. So thank you again for coming on um, today. Um, and I like thank to thank you. Antoine. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I like to thank everyone for watching or listening. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, just make sure you hit that like or subscribe button to be notified of any time we put out new content. Uh, and if you're listening to this on any of the podcasting platforms, just hit that subscribe button. And also uh, leave a review because reviews kind of help us to improve the process. There's always room for improvement. So uh, any right. feedback is always appreciated. And we have uh, we actually have two shows this week. So our next show will be Thursday. So it'll be our, actually the 100th interview. <laughs> so it's a, it's a big deal for us. Which uh, So we have Leo from Nova Cigars. Um, you all might follow her on Instagram as uh, Cigar Blondie. So uh, we'll be talking about Nova Cigars and uh, some new projects that she has going on and uh, celebrating 100 episodes of this stuff. So <laughs> it'll be a pretty fun and a uh, big deal for us. So kind of join us Thursday. And uh, if you miss any of this show, uh, it will be up on deepcutslive.com later on tonight. Uh, and like I said, you can see it on Facebook, uh, on the Deep Cuts Live channel and also on uh, YouTube. So thank you again. And thank you, Lee, for spending an hour with us. And uh, until next time, everybody, have a good night. Cheers. Have a good day, morning and everything else. <laughs> <laughs>